all right you guys welcome to the channel um i'm gonna just start off by saying i am so legit nervous about doing this video and i don't even know why i truly can't tell you exactly why part of it may be that normally i really have things well put together um about how i want to kind of say things when i do videos but i was just like talking to God about this particular video, you know, just telling my story, my testimony. And I was like, God, I don't even know how to piece it together. And I feel like one of the reasons is when people tell their testimony, they normally have like this aha turning point moment and God stepped in and he saved them. And, you know, then they went on to continue their believing life. But the truth is, I feel like I messed up so many times. Y'all, I did my makeup and I feel like I'm already about to cry, but I messed up so many times. Like there is not a like one moment that I can point to where I can see like, oh man, and then God stepped in and I changed everything. Like God literally chased after me and I want to help people that I know God is chasing after. And, um, oh my gosh, it's happening already. But okay, I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna tell you now, this video is probably gonna be done, like, there's gonna be multiples of these because I'm not just gonna sit here and keep you guys here for hours. I'm 36 years old. There's a lot of life to tell right here. So anyways, let me get started. So I feel like if I was to look over my life and look at a scripture, I felt like God pointed me to this scripture this morning um, to share with you guys. If I was to look at an account in the Bible that looked like my life, it would be the Valley of Dry Bones. And this is in Ezekiel, so um, a lot of people aren't as familiar with it, especially if you're not like, I don't know, whatever. A lot of people aren't as familiar with it. But basically, it was a vision that God gave to Ezekiel and he um, showed him this valley and it was just like these dry, scattered bones. And obviously they were like all dead because, you know, it's just bones and they're scattered in this desert and they were dry. And God looked at Ezekiel and he was like, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel was like, only you know that God. And, um... In the midst of it, like, God was like, prophesy to these bones and, you know, tell them to live. And the bones started, like, coming together. And then he was like, now tell them to, like, get skin on them and everything. And they started to get, like, skin that covered the bones. And after that, like, God was like, now prophesy and have the winds come so they can have life and have breath again. And they did and then the bones you know were living and god was like this is me um the picture of what i'm gonna do for my people is real and i'm gonna have them to live again like they were in this you know dry decrepit place obviously and like when i look at my life i feel like there were so many times things were so scattered just so messed up like just looked like so far beyond hope. And um, I don't know, I don't know. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start telling my story. Maybe, I don't know, it's just gonna have to come together. So basically, I am a preacher's kid. Yeah, um, I hate it. <laughs> I, hate, I hate the term PK. Um, I feel like, <sighs> It, it cripples so many people. Um, I've seen it cripple so many people that I love because it's like you get this title before you can be a person. Um, and people start having these thoughts and these ideas about who you're going to be. And it's either really good or like really bad. Like there's never any in between. And so... Um, my mom, she actually went into labor with me during a Wednesday night service. So I am a church girl through and through. Um, and so 
it was funny, like every year when I was growing up, my mom on my birthday, she would tell, and all of us, I have three older brothers. She would tell us all the story of like how we were born. And it was just, I loved it. I looked forward to it every single year. She'd be like, Crystal, it was a Wednesday night service. And I was sitting on the front row and the pastor had just said, nobody else get up. I'm tired of y'all doing all this walking around. And my water broke. And she was like, I had to get up, of course. And so, um, you know, her water broke and she got up and she was running out and I came into the world and um, we moved to Atlanta. I mean, we moved from Atlanta to Tampa when I was like three going on four. Um, and so I was like, you know, a little kid, what do I know? Um, I do remember that when I started going to school in like first grade kindergarten, uh, <laughs> we had a coffee table Bible and a lot of people may not even know what that is anymore, but a coffee table Bible was massive. Like it was like, like this, like, and it was like this thick, like it was the biggest, thickest Bible ever. And I would put it in my backpack and I would take it to school and I would want to tell people about Jesus. Like that was my thing. Um, and my mom was like, Crystal, this book is too heavy. Like it's not good for you to have this on your back. You're small, but I wanted to take it. Like I wanted to tell people about Jesus. Like that was what our family was about. We had moved to Tampa to start a church. My dad was starting a church and that's what we did. We went to church and my brothers were my friends. And, you know, I made like friends at school, but most of my friends were church friends um, because I spent so much time there, especially once I got into like my older years, like middle school, high school stuff. Like I didn't go to like games on Friday nights and stuff like that because we had service on Friday night. And so, I was there at church with all the other kids whose parents had them come to church on Friday night. And so it was like, that was just my life. That was my life, that's what I did. And I think that the first moment that I really started to feel a way, um, if I could put it that way, <laughs> about being like a PK and feeling bad and I don't know, whatever. I was like 16, 17 years old, probably like 16. And I liked a guy. Of course I liked guys, I was a girl. And I liked a guy, but dating, not allowed. And so um, I remember like, I liked this guy and he liked me back and you know, whatever. But I was committed, so committed to being a virgin when I got married. Um, that was something that I had taught. It was something I believed, or at least I, I guess I believed it. Um, I might have just been really scared of going to hell um, because that was like the thought, like if you have sex, you're probably going to immediately go to hell. Like the floor is going to bust wide open. You're going to fall in and that's going to be your eternity. Um, either that or I would have sex and then before I could repent for it, I would go to hell. Like all roads led to hell. So um, I was terrified <laughs> of having sex. And honestly, I didn't really want to. Like, I was completely content and fine with waiting. Um, and then I remember it like it was yesterday. I was walking across like our church parking lot and someone looked at me and they were like, I see those hips spreading, what you doing? And honestly, in my naive 15, 16 year old mind, like I literally didn't even know what they were alluding to. Like I genuinely did not know. Um, I later found out <laughs> what they were alluding to, but I genuinely didn't know. And it's crazy because it seemed like from there, like lies, like people were just telling so many lies. It was insane. Um, I remember one time someone thought I was friends with um and that was anyways someone that I was friends with had told my mom that I skipped school so that I could go have an abortion I was still a virgin at the time um and my mom of course was like hmm like when when did this happen like what day was this like and they're like oh it was this day at this time and she had this person pick her up and they had this really like elaborate story 
and God's grace because honestly, I lied. I lied to my parents a lot at that time, but this particular day that they were like, yes, it was this exact day, this exact time, everything. My mom had picked me up from school and I was with her the whole day because I had debilitating cramps. And so it was like, the details of the lie. And you would think like, it wasn't even that just like, this girl that was supposed to be my friend had lied. This girl that was supposed to be my friend had lied, told a bunch of adults. Adults bought this to my mom. Like, it was painful to hear so many people tell lies like that and other lies um, for no reason. Like, the detail they would put into these lies about what I was doing, what I was saying, where I was going, like, and it hurt because it was like it was people that was supposed to be my friend um and side note even that person like that told that lie like they've been forgiven like we're cool like immaturity we grow up times go on um so that's cool um, but yeah like but it was it was hard and I felt like I got to a point where I couldn't, I couldn't get past the lies. Um, no matter how good I tried to be, no matter how much I tried to prove that I wasn't this person, um, everybody saw me as this person that I wasn't. Um, and so, you know, it was from what I wore to how I spoke to people to like everything was like just under like such a magnifying glass. Like I was, I honestly wasn't doing anything other than what normal teenage girls do. I probably was doing a lot less than what a lot of normal teenage girls do, but it was put on a pedestal and everybody always knew when i got in trouble because my punishment for getting in trouble would be that i couldn't go to like where our teen ministry was but i'm not mad at that because a lot of times the teen ministry is where it went down um all the things so like but when i would get in trouble i had to sit on the front row i couldn't sit with the teens in service i couldn't go over to the teen ministry building like i had to sit on the front row and so again I don't fault my parents for that. I feel like no parent gets a rule book. You do the best you can with, with, the, with the information you have. And um, it, it, I'm sure that that was a legitimate, even now, that was a legitimate, you know, trade. But again, the only thing was like, I was literally sitting on the front row and I never sat on the front row unless I was in trouble. And so people would always see when I came in sat on the front row and it's crazy like, I didn't, the older I got, the less friends I had kind of because I just been betrayed a lot of times by people who were saying they were my friends, but just because of immaturity, like I don't even blame them. I'm not pointing at their character, but their age and their immaturity caused them to just lie and just say things that weren't true, whether it was to get the focus off of them then you know, cause it was more entertaining, I guess, to talk about me. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I would walk in, I'd sit on the front row and everybody, by the end of service, like there were probably at least 10 different stories about what I had done to end up there. And I just remember getting to a point where I felt like they always say PKs are the worst one. And please stop saying that. If you're one of the people that says that, please stop saying that. You have no idea the damage it does but it they just it was just it it kept happening and i kept trying to do the right thing but even if i did a little bad thing like i don't know a small bad thing um that was again run of the mill for a teenager it became this i told you pks are always the worst ones type of thing and I remember I woke up one day and I said to myself, they're going to think it, I might as well be it. And 
that was literally like the beginning of the end. <laughs> Um, it was the beginning of a downfall that, you know, they say like sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. And that, that was the moment that I, I, I spiraled, like I literally spiraled. Um, <sighs> I'm trying to see how much can I get into in this video. We'll just keep going for now. So, so yeah. So I was like, whatever. If they say I'm the worst, I'm going to be the worst. Actually, I'm going to show them what the worst really looks like because I am a hundred percenter. Um, and it's funny. I'm pretty sure I get that from my dad. Uh, he was like, you know, when he was living for the world, he was living for the world. But when he was living for God, like he was on fire for God. And I get that hundred percent ism from him because once I decided I was gonna be the worst, I didn't care, I literally didn't care. And I remember um, I had, I lost my virginity, um, not even because I was just like so in love, <laughs> just because like my friend, <laughs> talk to a friend so I was dating I wasn't supposed to be dating um but I was and so I because I was hiding it I couldn't really ask for like good advice from people with like good sense I had to ask most of my friends who didn't have good advice or good sense because they was my age they was just doing what I was doing so um I had called my friend and I was like, girl, he wants to like go all the way. And she was like, oh, you should do it. Like I, I did. And I was like, what you did? And I was like, uh, oh, okay then I guess, I guess I will. It happened. And from there, we had been dating for like a year, like, a, yeah, we had been dating for like a year, maybe a little longer when it happened. And, um, it was like, okay, whatever. <sighs> Months later, a couple months later, actually like on my birthday, literally on my birthday, um, he decided to have sex with one of my closest friends. Um, and I would definitely say this is a turning point and that's why I bring it up because it started a journey of who I became um, after that happened. And so whatever, I found out, his friend told me, um, I called him and I asked about it and he was honest. He was like, yes, it's true. And I was like, okay. And I was really hurt, I felt betrayed. Um, and I was just like, I had to call you back. Like, so I got the phone and it's like weird my mind like went through this cycle because i didn't care about him so much i cared about the fact that i thought he chose her over me and i didn't like feeling rejected and i didn't like feeling like i wasn't the first choice and so I um <laughs> I caught him later or whatever, saw him, I don't know, whatever. It was so many years ago at this point. But I talked to him again and I was like, So what are you gonna do? And he's like, Oh, you're not like gonna break up with me and I was like, I mean, if you wanna be with her, like fine, but you know, you should wanna be with me. Like, and I can show you why you should wanna be with me. So obviously that led to more, you know. Um, and I noticed that I note this as a turning point because it's definitely like the first time I feel like I started trying to use my body to get what I want um, from a guy. That is a really bad slippery slope. Um, but I 
I feel like I just equated like, I don't know. I don't know. I was young and I was dumb. And that's what I decided to do. So at any rate, he stopped talking to her. At least he said he stopped talking to her. He could have been lying. I have no idea. Um, we kept seeing each other and I kept getting in trouble until I left. So that was my senior year of high school. I graduated in May. And after I graduated, my parents and I both agreed it would be best for me to leave. <laughs> um, to leave and go spend some time with my god sister. She's older than me, um, I don't know, by like over 20 years or something. Um, but she's older than me and they were like, it's probably best that we give this relationship some space. And cause I, and I was, I was literally out of control. Um, I was out of control. I, I was, I, but I was really sneaky. Like I was extremely sneaky and they didn't, it was, it was for the best. I wasn't even, I wasn't upset when it happened. It was for the best. And so it was like, the arrangement was I would go live with my god sister and I would pay rent, get a job, do all these things. They're like, you want to be an adult, you want to be grown, go do it. And I was like, finally. Um, so I left literally like maybe two days or three days after I graduated from high school. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a long time. Um, and when I say like I was out of control, like I was getting in trouble in school. I skipped so much of my senior year. Thank God I graduated. I went to night school for a little bit because I thought I was going to fail one of my classes. Thank God I didn't. Um, I did track and field. I was pretty good. Not like Olympic level good, but I was pretty good. I would qualify for districts and state and everything, but I quit. Like I quit doing track like in lavish fashion, like throwing the baton at the coach, like yelling on the field. Like I quit at least three times that year. Um, before she was finally just like, Crystal, like, you have to stop. Like, and she cared so much. Her name was Coach Palmer, and I value her. Like, I feel like she could see that I had so much going on, and I didn't know where to place it. Um, but yeah. So, I left. I went to Atlanta, hot Atlanta, um, for me that summer. Um, and a couple summers after that if I'm being honest. But um, I went to go live with my guy sister and I was like, okay. And she was like, okay, you up here, you supposed to be grown. Like my rule is you need to be in this house before I lock the door. Don't too much care where you're at or what you're doing. You say you grown, be grown. Make sure you pay what you're supposed to pay and be in this house before I lock the door. Cause once the door is locked, you can't come in. And I was like, okay. And I knew that to be true because she came down to get me with one of my friends that I had met in Atlanta. And she left us at a Walmart in Tipton, Georgia, y'all. She was like, when I'm ready to go, y'all need to be at the car. Wherever we was, whatever we was doing, probably trying to be hot and fast somewhere. We were not at the car. She left. She left and drove to like a hotel, stayed there for like three hours and finally came back and got us. So she taught me early on, when I say I'm gonna lock this door and it's not gonna be open back up, I knew she meant it. She was not selling a bill of goods. So I went up there for this summer. Um, oh, before I left, of course, the guy that I was dating, he's like, so are we gonna, um, you know, we'll do the long distance. I was like, I have no interest in that. <laughs> I have literally zero interest. And he's like, you know, but I thought like, we're in love and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I just told you those things because I was upset and I didn't want you talking to the other girl. Like, I literally don't want to be with you. Um, and I was just like, I mean, I'm grown now. I'm going away for the summer. And when I get back, we can see what happens. Like, that's the best I can even give you. But I'm not committed to you while I'm gone. And so he was upset about it, obviously. But, you know, that's what it was. So I went away for the summer. I came back and I wanted to move out. I wanted to move out so bad, but I didn't have any money to move out. So my parents were like, okay, what are you gonna do? Um, you need to go to school, you need to do something. And I was like, well, I'll go to community college. I wasn't really like big on going to school, but I decided 
what else am I gonna do? Yeah, so went to college, community college, and I was back home and a guy called my house. This was top tier, like what? Because I wasn't allowed to talk on the phone to boys. But at this point, I was like 18, going on 19, and I could I could do that now. Like I could do that. And so the guy called, he, my dad answered the phone. And he's like, what do you want with Crystal? And mom's like, she's 18, she can date. Like when is she supposed to start dating? So um, the guy was like, oh, you know, I really want to take Crystal on a date. He was a nice, a nice enough guy, he, he was. Um, I actually dated him for like a year and a half. I didn't really like him though. Um, I liked the thought that I was allowed to date. Literally, that was it. I liked that I could date. I liked that people could call and I could take their call. I liked that I could go out somewhere, have dinner, and it was allowed. I liked that I could leave the house and say I was going with my boyfriend. I liked being wanted and the fact that I could date. And so this is a big thing because I know Sometimes people think, oh, it's because somebody didn't have a father in the home or whatever, that girls act like needy or want this attention and things like that. My dad loved me so well. He always told me I was beautiful. He always told me I was smart. He affirmed me, he encouraged me. But there is a difference between a dad doing those things because you are his daughter and a guy that has no need to be nice, kind, call you beautiful or anything, choosing you. And I wanted to be chosen. Um, I, if I'm honest, I think that I was still really scarred from that first relationship that I had where I felt like I wasn't chosen and I wanted to see who would choose me. And so, you know, more spirals downward so um i dated this guy for like a year and a half and ultimately the relationship ended because he said he wanted to marry me and i knew i didn't want to do that so i was he's like you know like I, we've been dating this time and he was away in school so it was easy to date him because he wasn't there um <laughs> it was the longest relationship the whole time he would come back and visit because he was only like four hours away but when he would spend like I one time he came home for like three weeks or something it must have been like Christmas break and it was like just so miserable like I was with him like so much and I just hated it and after that is when he was like I think we should get married and I was like I think we should see other people and that was that so I told him we could see what would happen um maybe let's just I told him he should see other people and he was like well what about if are you gonna see other people? And I was like, yeah, maybe, like who knows? But I definitely knew I was planning to see other people and that I didn't plan to get back together with him. And that was bad, cause I lied, but I lied a lot then. So, and I'm telling you all this stuff because I feel like it's maybe gonna help with context to all of the mess like that God really pulled me out of. Cause it, it was a mess, it was a mess. So, yeah, that happened, and then I started dating this other guy. Um, and I met him through the counselor at my community college. You're thinking, oh, you meet this guy through your counselor, he's gonna be a great guy. No, he was not a great guy, he was awful. He was a drug dealer, and he did all kinds of illegal things, and he was unkind, he was rude. Um, verbally abusive, um, at times physically abusive, only like twice though, um, but he would always threaten. Um, and I don't say only twice to excuse it, like abusive relationships are not okay, leave. But I also understand how hard it is to leave when you're in an abusive relationship because normally it starts off with like verbal abuse and that is how they break you down so much. Um, he used to always just tell me like nobody else would want you like nobody would want to be with you like you're not even that cute like look at you like he would just say these things and it did he wouldn't say it back to back at first like he would just say it and it would be like slide but then like 
over time, because I dated him for like a year and a half, um, over time, like it just, it just kept piling more and more on and to the point where I thought I couldn't go anywhere else. There wasn't anybody else that wanted me. And if I didn't stay with him, even though he was a liar and a cheater and constantly talking bad about me, like even though there were all these things, he really made me think like there was no one else that would ever consider being with me. And again, knowing that a lot of people that I even entertained during this time was because I was trying to feed that thought of being wanted, like that was one of my greatest fears. So I stayed because I didn't want to be alone. I didn't want to feel unwanted. Um, I didn't want to feel unloved. I didn't want to feel rejected because even going back to, you know, like earlier, um, in the childhood, in my teenage years and stuff, friends that came and went because a lot of my friends were at the church and if the, if their parents left the church, they left the church and most of the time it just meant the friendship dropped off. Like we didn't have cell phones and all that back then so it was just like today your best friend gone tomorrow like and it sucked so bad um but over like time i grew so used to it um to not having control over people that i could be friends with because even if they wanted to be friends with me and i wanted to be friends with them like they were just gone i grew used to people like smiling um saying things to my parents like oh i love you you're so great but then like talking so bad about them behind their backs and just it was rough like it was really rough and i think that so much of that um just developed into me lashing out me being so out of control um and then of course all of that coupled with the own your my own personal things that you just navigate growing up as a young person like it led me it just led me down a really dark place so yeah i started dating this guy he's absolute trash for me um but i was caught up in it um this video has been 32 minutes now um hopefully you can kind of see where i'm going with like the valley of dry bones um i feel like for me a lot of the dry bones were thoughts i had about myself um insecurities flaws feeling like i wasn't wanted feeling like i couldn't get ahead no matter if i tried or what I did, people would always see me in a certain light, see me in a certain way. Um, there was just so much damage. Um, and I don't know. It, it's just, it's crazy because it seems like it was also controllable, but at the same time, I feel like I wanted to be loved so much. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be respected. But then literally everything I did contradicted the ability for that to happen. And I'm old enough now to know, oh, it's because the enemy is at work. But then I just, I couldn't figure it out. I felt like no matter how hard I tried and no matter what I did, it just got worse. It just got worse. But yeah, so we'll be back <laughs> for more of my journey picking up where I left off. Um, I promise there's a testimony in this. Me being here today is a testimony in this. I think, um, you know, I tell you guys, oh, I met, I got engaged, I got married in nine months and that's like the mountain top to my testimony like to the beginning of my testimony it's still growing and everything but it's like that that was when it arrived but it's like when you hear the backstory 
of all of this, you understand so much more why it's such a testimony because it's who I am now, the confidence I have today in me, in the God in me, in being able to be me and to be loved and be accepted and give love and give acceptance and encourage people like that is the testimony and again understanding all of that <laughs> what i will be sharing is is gonna help you see and i think too it's gonna help make it really clear um who i want to help and why I don't give up on people easily. Um, yeah, so let the journey begin.